about this dangerous flooding out in Colorado. Four to six inches of rain in a short period of time. Much water moving with such force. It also carries cars down the street. Um, we're, you know, our basement is flooding and our neighbors came by to ask how we were. And it was a set of neighbors that we have been trying to get to know and it's been really, really hard. And nothing has seemed to connect. And so I'd kind of given up. Um, well, one of these sets of neighbors, uh, she came over, the wife came over, and the adult son comes over and he offers to bring some food, and we get into this conversation about cooking and food, and it was the first time that I felt like I could connect with him, because I always think about the part that I do in neighboring, and this felt like reverse neighboring, and, um, and part of neighboring is receiving from them, and also just not making those assumptions. Like I said, these difficult neighbors um, just, you know, really awkward to get to know, turn out to be just really sweet, gentle, generous people. I think it's, it seems sort of interesting to me that part of the way God has brought us together as neighbors was that our basement was the one that needed to flood so that we connected in a new way. So um, just, for, just for God to be in and through all of that. Something going on in our hearts, something new going on in our hearts, an understanding heart. It's going to take our eyes being open a little bit more than they are right now, and it's going to take our ears to be open a little bit more as they are. So let me pray and just ask God to do that very thing. Father, I, I would pray that you would do something supernatural in all of us as we look at the scriptures today, both from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and, and the New Testament, God, how you have a heart for those that you call our neighbors in need, often referred to also as the least of these, and those who are at risk or marginalized in society for whatever reason. And a disaster certainly falls into that category. I pray that you'd open our eyes to just how important this is to you and how much you tell us throughout your word that we're supposed to care for the things that you care for. So give us hearts of understanding. Open our eyes a little bit more. Let us hear things that we've not heard before, that we might be able to glorify you a little bit more from this day forward. And I pray in Yeshua, in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, my family is a lot like your family. When our kids were growing up, they played multiple sports, and uh, Andrew and I were their biggest fans, but sometimes we were too big of a fan. And one time, one time in particular, uh, our son Michael was playing a Little League baseball game in Andrea. Those of you know my, my, my sweet, gentle, you know, soft-spoken Andrea became, be, became displeased with the calls that this umpire was making. And so she began to shout out. She, she actually got up from her seat in the bleachers and walked down to the chain link fence because that's as close as you can get to the umpire and begin to shout out her displeasure. Come on, ump, what are you, blind or something? Open your eyes, you need glasses, come on. And evidently, evidently this went on a little bit too long <laughs> because the very next day we were paid a visit, an official visit, by the head of the league umpires who happened to be, you guessed it, one of our neighbors. <laughs> All I can say is that was a really awkward moment in our lives. But those of you that know Andrea, uh, if you've never been to a baseball game with Andrea, she is like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde when it comes to baseball. So if you want to go to a Rockies game, she would love to go with you and you'll see a whole different side of her. Spiritually speaking, sometimes we can't see things that are right in front of our eyes until God opens them up. You think of that famous hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And I think, you know, for most of us in this room today, 
that at one point in our lives we found God, particularly if we're a little older, I think you'd agree that, that you would probably say, you know, once I was just blind to, to believing in God and then something happened that opened my eyes. For me, 21 years ago, I visited a church in Irvine, California. My wife and kids had been attending it for about six months. At that time in my life, prior to visiting that church, I would have described myself as a hardcore atheist. I would have looked at you and said, look, if you believe in God, you know, you're just a fool and you're obviously weak. You need some, time, some kind of a crutch in your life. And then I walked through the door of that church that day. And all I can say is that the experience was like the blinders just came off. And obviously it has changed the course of my life 21 years ago. It changed the course of my life forever. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 2 through 6, Moses has led the Israelites through the desert now for 40 years. He's near the end of his life, and so he summons all the Israelites together. And this is what he says to him in, in verse 2. He says, you have seen, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all this, his land. The great trials that your eyes saw. You know, he's really camping on this eyesight thing, right? The signs, those great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. And if you, if you read on the very next verse, I didn't put it up on the screen, but the very next verse, Moses reminds them. He says, you know, all these 40 years, your clothes never, the clothes on your back never wore out and the shoes on your feet never wore out. Can you imagine going 40 years without ever having the soles of your shoes wear out. I know some of you are going, no, 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 no. I, don't, I wouldn't want to do that. Not without Dr. Scholl's, you know, odor eaters or something like that. <laughs> but you think about it, you know, they didn't, they, that's all they had. And there was no resources in the desert to, uh, to get new clothes or, you know, there wasn't a shoemaker somewhere along the route. It just, it just didn't happen. And yet, with all those things that took place, even though they saw with their eyes all these supernatural events, with these physical eyes they had, their spiritual eyes were still closed. And so they were blinded to a deeper understanding about who God was and how to live out their life of faith. Forty years earlier, God leads Moses up to the top of Mount Sinai and he gives him the Torah. The Torah contains 613 rules about how, to live, how they're going to live together once they entered into the promised land. After Moses dies, Joshua takes them across the Jordan River. And for the next 1,400 years, they attempt to put these rules into practice. And, and on one occasion, 1,400 years later, a Jewish teacher of the law asks a young rabbi named Yeshua, his name Jesus, which of these 613 mitzvot do you think is the greatest? And Jesus answers the man's question by quoting two of the commandments from the Torah. First, the first one from Deuteronomy 6.5. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. In other words, love God with every fiber of your being. And the second one is from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, the second half. He says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But then in the, in, when Jesus finishes sharing these two commandments, he says something very deep and profound. And he says, on these two commandments, hinge or depend all of the Torah and all of the prophets. And you don't want to miss this because he's saying, you know, if you don't get some things, if you think the Bible's too complicated, you think faith is too complicated, you think God is too complicated to understand, well, simplify it. You can boil it down to two simple concepts. Love God and love your neighbor. Like, in the same way that you would take care of yourself, take care of your neighbor. And this revelation should have blown this teacher away. And yet because he still didn't have his heart open and his eyes open and his ears open, he says to Jesus, yeah, but who's my neighbor? He's looking for a loophole, right? But it just shows that he, as he's looking for a loophole in this second commandment, 
the second greatest commandment, the question indicates that he doesn't get the first greatest commandment. Because when you, listen, when you love God with every fiber of your being, then you will inherently love your neighbor in return. You can't say, I love God, and say, I don't love my neighbor at the same time. And Jesus couldn't boil this teacher's question down to just one commandment. It's no, it's, you know, I don't know if you ever thought about it. You, he asked him for one, and he couldn't just get one. He had to get two. And the reason is you simply can't have one without the other. They are inseparable. And we find this inseparable pairing throughout the entire Bible. James says it this way. In James chapter 2, verse 14 through 17, he says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Well, go in peace and be warm and be filled, without giving them the things needed. This is a neighbor in need. For the body, what good is that? So also faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And don't miss this. you got to notice this. The only example that James uses to describe works that is produced by faith is about caring for a neighbor's need. Faith without works is dead because you can't say, I love God, and say, I don't love my neighbor at the same time, especially if it's a neighbor in need. Jesus says it this way in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23 and 24. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices and mint and dill and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, right? Here we go. We're back on the eyes again. You, sh you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Gnats are considered unclean in the Torah. And so some people use to, use to you know, take like a cheesecloth and pour their liquids over the cheesecloth just to make sure they don't swallow something that is forbidden in the law. And Jesus is using, he, this is a very humorous, he's using humor and sarcasm. I love it that the Lord Yeshua uses sarcasm, okay? It just validates my entire life right here. <laughs> He uses this humorous sarcasm to make a point that their religiosity, their legalism, may have kept them from swallowing that tiny gnat. But their spiritual blindness is causing them to miss swallowing a giant camel. It's a, it's a visual image that's intended to be both funny and very graphic. I like this cartoon right here. Hey, there's a gnat in your soup while well, he's holding a camel in his spoon, you know. <laughs> now notice, Jesus doesn't condemn. In fact, he says they should, they should keep these practices. It's the practices aren't bad, right? I want you to, you get that. He said you should have, you should have neglected the former, you know. You should have done that and do the latter and do the former as well. So, um, but notice... That the danger of being religious is that it can lead to spiritual blindness. It can make you narrow-sighted. And, and, and notice once again that the only example that Jesus gives is that these guys couldn't see how they were neglecting their neighbors in need. Just like James did in the last passage we looked at. And what are the more important matters of the law? Justice, mercy, faithfulness. All the ways that we are to love our neighbors in need. One more, the prophet Isaiah makes this even clearer in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 5 through 12. As he speaks to those who were fasting, they're using fasting as a way to demonstrate their love for God, but were neglecting to love their neighbors in need. And in the same fashion as James and Jesus, Isaiah says to the religious Jews of his day, Is this the kind of fast I've chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable 
to the Lord. Now, he's not slamming fasting here, right? Fasting is a good spiritual discipline to practice. You might, you might think here that it is probably referenced, that Jesus referenced this in the, in the New Testament when he talked about, listen, when you fast, don't put sackcloth and ashes on your head and look like you're, oh, oh, how you doing? Well, I'm fasting. Oh, poor you. Because he said you're just looking for praise from men, right? Instead, put oil on your head and look good and just keep it between you and God. So Isaiah has a little of this in mind. But he's also, he's also referring to, to using these spiritual practices in a way that's neglecting their responsibility to their neighbors. And he's saying, is not this the kind of fast that I have chosen? And look what he says here. To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And when you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. You can't say you love God and say, I don't love my neighbor at the same time. This is why we read in Acts chapter 2. Remember what happens in Acts chapter 2. Jesus has ascended back to the Father and the 120 disciples go up into this upper room and they're waiting and on Acts chapter 2 on, on, on Shavuot, the Holy Spirit comes and Peter gives and all these Jewish pilgrims are in town because that's one of the feasts that they have to come to Jerusalem to celebrate and they see what's going on and Peter gives this message and at the end of that message, they go from 120 to 3,000. Talk about church growth. I've never given a message like that. Usually when I give a message, the church goes the other way. So... <laughs> But now it's like, oy vey, what do we do? We got 3,120 people. And so you see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it starts talking about how they met every day in the temple courts and, and they listened to the apostles' teaching. But look at this. This just stands out. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. These were neighbors in need and look how radical they are selling homes and possessions whatever it took to make sure that nobody went without when you fast forward to Acts chapter 6 we find the early now they've, they've got a little more sophisticated there's more people and and they're, they're starting to organize a little those of you that 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 like house churches and you like less organization, well, you probably would love Acts chapter 2, but you won't like Acts chapter 6 because now they're more organized. And they, one of the things that they're doing is that they're, they have a few food distribution to widows. Women back then, especially widows, were, were vulnerable in that male-dominated society. And so the church made sure that their basic needs were being taken care of. And in this particular example, you know, there's some widows that are being neglected and, and they're solving it. They're... they're they're troubleshooting, and they're making sure that, that none of these widows go without. This is also why the apostles affirmed to Paul and Barnabas in Galatians chapter 9. If, if, if you recall, you know, Paul is, is going to be the apostle to the non-Jewish population, to the Gentiles. Peter and the other apostles are going to go to the Jewish people. And so they, they get together, and they, they affirm to Saul and Barnabas, yes, you know, we want you to go and, and bring the gospel to the non-Jewish world. But we also want you to be careful not to let your evangelistic enthusiasm get in the way of helping your poor, the poor along the way. It's the only thing they tell them. I mean, you think about all the things you'd want to warn them about, and this is the one thing. Make sure you take care of the poor. Why? Why? Because that's the theme throughout the entire word from beginning to end. Richard Stearns, in his book, A Hole in the Gospel, says it this way. I love this. One dollar a day versus more than a hundred dollars a day. That is the disparity between the average American and the bottom billion people on the planet. One dollar versus a hundred dollars a day. He goes on to say, the Apostle Paul spoke to this same issue of disparity in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 13 through 15, when he urged the wealthier Corinthian church to make a relief offering 
to the, to the believers in Jerusalem who were in dire economic circumstances. And then he quotes that passage. He says, this is Paul speaking, Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, he wrote, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. In other words, there could be a time in the future, probably will be, that you're going to need something. Then there will be equality, as it is written. He who gathered much did not have much, and he who gathered little did not have little. Stearns goes on to say that the Bible is clear from the Old Testament through the New, that God's people always had a responsibility to see that everyone in their society was cared for at a basic needs level. Ruth was able to glean wheat from Boaz's field because God had instructed those who controlled the land to not harvest everything so that there would be food left for the poor. And then he quotes Leviticus 23, 22. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the stranger. Today's a little different than most days. We have visiting with us today 10 justice organizations that are set up in our courtyard. And these organizations are on the front lines both locally here in Boulder County and in this country and globally around the world to assist in loving our neighbors in need. Let me tell you who we have here representing us. We have someone from Kids Against Hunger. It's an organization that try, significantly tries to reduce world hunger among children by packaging highly nutritious meals, distributing them worldwide in partnerships with humanitarian organizations. We have partnered with them several times, and so we're glad that they're here today. We have Reintegra, which is the foundation for survivors of human trafficking uh, in Mexico to help these girls re-enter, Reintegra, get new, you know, new insides on them, uh, re-enter into society, provide life of dignity and security. We have Boulder County Care Connect, which promotes the security and comfort and independence of seniors and adults with disabilities in Boulder County. We have EFA, Emergency Family Assistance Association. It helps those in our community whose immediate needs for food, shelter, and other basic necessities cannot be adequately met by other means and supports their efforts towards financial stability, self-sufficiency. We have Attention Homes, provides opportunities for at-risk youth to change their lives. They give them shelter, community-based living, and teaching of life skills necessary for an independent future. We have BOHO, Boulder Outreach for Homeless Overflow, uh, that works with faith communities to help fill the gaps of current support network for homeless in Boulder in terms of emergency needs for basic shelter and care. They're the organization that, that uses our facility to house homeless when the temperatures get freezing. We've had seven campers in our courtyard uh, the entire summer. They were even there last night, although they snuck inside because it started to freeze. Uh, we have Heritage House, which provides nurturing and loving home for at-risk adolescent girls ages 12 through 18 who, for various reasons, are unable to remain with their primary caregivers. We have Real Choices Pregnancy Care Center, which offers practical help, education, and group support for women of all ages facing an unexpected pregnancy. We have Team World Vision, which is a subset of people here at Cornerstone and some others around the area that, uh, are, that run marathons to raise money to help bring clean water to African children. They ran a marathon uh, a few weeks ago. They're going to run another one in 2014. So if you'd like to do that, go check them out. And then we have our very own Cornerstone Flood Relief Table, which is uh, ongoing efforts to partner with the community in helping with ongoing flood relief. Um, our, our, I'm guessing that most of the people in those organizations are here. Are you all here? Could you just stand up and come on inside a little bit so people can see who you are? And let's, let's just give them a hand. And... We really want to honor you because you just lay it right out there. And I know it's hard getting resources and uh, both financial and people resources. So all of you, make sure you go out there and visit with them before you leave. We're going to get you out here a few minutes early so you'll have time to do that. And some of you might want to help them financially and some of you might want to just volunteer. If you're a, a, a small group leader of any kind here, maybe you can do it together uh, as a group 
uh, as we're always looking for ways to, to, to work and, and uh, serve our community together. So we also have many more organizations and opportunities listed on our webpage. If you go to our webpage and you click on that First Things tab at the top and then click on the Love Your Neighbor in Need, you will find a page that looks like this. And that actually scrolls down. There are just numerous opportunities, both locally and globally. They are listed by level of commitment. So you can see, let's see, the, uh, the Adopt Colorado Kids uh, has a two to three commitment. So one means that it's, the obligation is once a year. Just once, I mean just once, so it's a one-time deal. Uh, two means a few times a year, three is monthly, and four is a weekly uh, obligation. And so make sure you go see them. And then I want to end by showing you a video, okay? So if, you, if you've been taking notes, I want you to put your pens down. If you've got your Bibles open or your smartphones, you know, because you're taking notes or you're answering texts or you're uh, re reading your Bible on your smartphones, just put it, put it away for a second. And let me warn you, get out a tissue instead, all right? And this, this video is called Change for a Dollar. I'm sure some of you have seen it. It's floated around uh, the internet for quite a while. It's about nine minutes long, so just get comfortable. And at the end of this video, we're going to take communion together. Um, and as you come up to take communion, I'd like you also... And everyone can take, we have one for everyone, so you don't have to just take one per family, all right? I want everybody to have one. This is change for a dollar. There's three quarters, two dimes, one nickel, and five pennies in here, okay? And so the idea with this is this is going to be a daily reminder for you to ask God to open your heart, open your eyes, open your ears. Tape it to the, your, your, your bathroom mirror. Tape it to the dashboard in your car. Stick it inside your Bible. Put it in your pocket. Put it somewhere where you'll see it every day so you can be reminded, particularly first thing in the morning, so that you'd be reminded to ask God to show you things. You want to you see things the way he sees things. You don't want to pass opportunities. We have neighbors in need all around us, all around us. And sometimes it just takes these things being opened a little bit more. Okay? And um, this is all going to make sense. This will all make sense when you watch the video. After the video, the ushers will come forward to dismiss you. If you're not planning on coming down to take communion, which is fine, then you can just go see an usher in the back and they'll give you a bag of change as you're leaving the auditorium today. And so, get ready.